Guys, I think I had an epiphany. I think I know how to fix the worst character on television. After watching three seasons of Emily in Paris, actively rotting my brain every single time, I think it's fair to say that, in recent memory, few TV characters have been more disliked than Emily Cooper. If you follow my channel, you know that I've spent a lot of time analyzing this character in an attempt to understand why she doesn't work. Hell, I literally started this channel doing just that. The reason why that fascinates me is because there are plenty of bad characters on television, but not quite like Emily. Even the people who unironically love Emily in Paris are all in agreement that Emily is a dumpster fire of a character. She's annoying, and there are zero redeeming qualities that can salvage her image even a little bit. And keep in mind, there are a lot of bad TV and movie characters out there that are loved because they're played by beloved actors. But in this case, even somebody as adored as Lily Collins cannot save this character. Now, Emily has been criticized quite a lot over the last couple of years, in a way that I think took the writers of the show a bit by surprise. They have tried to write the ship with her, but after three seasons, I think it's safe to assume that the people behind this show do not know how to fix her character. The writers' ways of trying to make us like Emily more are completely misguided. For one, when they realize that everyone hated Emily and and largely preferred the character of Camille, they thought that ruining Camille's character would make us like Emily more and make us root for her? But it failed, because despite making Camille a detestable character over the last couple of seasons, they didn't make Emily any more likable. So the only thing they truly accomplished was ruining Camille. Long story short, the writers have made all the wrong decisions when it comes to handling Emily's underwhelming redemption arc, essentially leaving her an empty shell that only knows how to be annoying. Despite the fact that the show has become more tolerable than season one, and despite some characters improving or being genuinely great like Sylvie, Emily constantly finds herself left behind. She just sucks. All the time. Like I said in my previous video about the show, Emily is never a character you end up liking. You just sort of get used to her. And I have said before that I think it is way too late to fix her now, but I might have to take that back. If you look at Emily through the lens of the writers and how they seem to perceive her, then yeah, she's beyond saving, no question there. But there is another way to look at Emily that makes her somewhat salvageable. It's a bizarre way because it has to be, you really have to look somewhere else to find something to use to help her case, but it's not impossible. And if the writers are open-minded enough to change their perspective for a minute, it would actually be kind of easy. The reason why I started looking at it this way is because I thought of another character that was believed to be hated beyond repair. And that character is... Ahsoka Tano. Ahsoka is a character from the universe of Star Wars that was created by Dave Filoni and had her debut in a canon animated movie, The Clone Wars, that came out in 2008. No, I'm not gonna retell history here. Notoriously, The Clone Wars is a despised movie and is considered by many to be the worst thing to ever come out of Star Wars. And when the movie came out, it created a lot of anger with fans and a lot of that anger was aimed at Ahsoka. This character was ripped to shreds by the fandom. It was an absolute bloodbath. And to be fair, when watching that movie, it is very clear that Ahsoka was not an accomplished character. I've tried to look at it several times, but I just have to admit that she didn't work. She was annoying, the writing she was given was rather weak, she was introduced weirdly, and overall her story didn't work and she became the most hated Star Wars character overnight. Taking the throne from Jar Jar Binks. It was kind of brutal how despised she was, and that hatred completely broke the heart of Dave Filoni. That character was like his child, he created her himself and introduced her to the world, and she got completely torched in a way he had not expected at all. But he didn't want to just drop her, so instead he started working really really hard to figure out how to make her character work, and in a way, he completely reinvented her and came up with a story that would allow people to get attached to her. And and see her the way he sees her. And, surprisingly, 
it paid off. A surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one. Ahsoka Tano was reintroduced in the Clone Wars animated series, and his plan worked better than anyone could have ever imagined. Because Ahsoka is not slightly fixed, she is now one of the most beloved Star Wars characters of all time. She became so popular that she was recently taken out of the animation world to appear for the first time in live action, played by Rosario Dawson, who is a massive fan of the character and had been the fandom's dream casting choice for well over a decade. It's quite the accomplishment if I'm honest. The most hated character in a franchise known for having unforgiving fans managed to become a greatly beloved character people cherish and root for. So if they could do it for her, there has to be a way for Emily Cooper. And I figured it out in the most unexpected way imaginable. We're gonna talk about all that, but first, let me take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, Displate. Displate is a one-of-a-kind metal poster brand that is made to capture your passions. They're honestly really fun to have. See, you can customize, collect, and rearrange your displates at will. And it's easy because it literally takes 20 seconds to set them up with no power tools, no damages, and no frustrations. You don't need to put holes in your walls to hang them or anything because displates are set up with magnets. Literally, you just snap a magnet onto your wall and then you put a poster on it. Simple as that. And the fun part is that this plate has an insanely large variety of posters to choose from. You want some Star Wars? They got it. Marvel? They got it. DC, Witcher, Cyberpunk, don't worry about it, they got it. I've had some displays in my office for a while now and I love them. It really makes the room feel a bit more complete, it's really nice. And the cool part is that because they're mounted on magnets, it's super easy to switch your displays up. For example, I had this poster in my office, I bought it back in the summer so it had been a while and I was kind of wanting a change, so displate hooked me up and they were super kind to send me a variety of designs to replace it. I got them within 4-5 to five business days, which is the case for any order on this plate, and all I had to do to switch was take off the one that was already there and then snap the new one onto the magnets. It literally takes 10 seconds. And you know what? You guys are in luck! Because if you click the link in the description, this plate will give you 22% off a purchase of one or two posters and 33% off the purchase of three posters or more. It's a pretty sweet deal, so if you want to get some slick looking posters like me, make sure to check out the link in my description to get your own. Thank you so much to Displate for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to the show. Now, before we jump into how we can fix Emily, we first need to take another look at why the character doesn't work in the first place. I've talked about it at length already, you're welcome to revisit my videos, but let me just give you a quick little bullet list of the global reasons why she's considered to be the worst character on television. Emily is not a good person, she's not a very good friend, she's selfish, obnoxious, she doesn't know how to respect people's boundaries, she moves to Paris from America and refuses to respect the culture, she refuses to learn the language, she refuses to adapt, she thinks everything must be done her way. She's entitled, whiny, she makes everything about her, she's kind of an asshole, she's always complaining, she sleeps with her best friend's boyfriend behind her back, she sleeps with that same friend's little brother who is underage. You going to jail today, you going- You get it, it's not rocket science she's just the worst. And all of that on its own is not necessarily a problem if that's what you want the character to be. But the writers really want you to like Emily, so there's a pretty sharp disconnect here. It's like they don't realize how detestable she is. They seem to think she's quirky and that it should make her adorable, um, but no. And after the backlash of season 1 and season 2, once they realized it wasn't cute, they didn't know what to do to fix it. I mean, they tried, but like, did they? The issue is that the writers never really improved her character. They just toned her down a bit. But that's not a fix. She's still terrible, but just slightly less terrible. And 
And that's stupid. That's not how to fix a character. And that incomprehension from Darren Star and the writers frustrated me a lot, but I couldn't really put into words why I thought the writers weren't able to fix Emily in the way they've been trying to fix her over the past two seasons. It's something that's been in the back of my mind every single time I've talked about this show, but I could never quite put my finger on it. But then I had a really, really random and weird thought cross my mind, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since then. I think I had a bit of a eureka moment where I figured out how to fix Emily Cooper against all odds. Like I said, it's a very strange way to look at this character, and at first I just thought the show had finally destroyed me and I was losing my mind, uh, but no, I'm okay. Yeah, because the more I thought about it, the more it made sense in my head, and I now think this is the way to fix her character and actually make audiences see her in a more positive light. And I'm going to break it down for you. So this section is called, Here's How Emily in Paris Can Fix Its Main Character By Taking Inspiration From Naruto. No, it's not a joke, shut up and listen. Yup, to kick this off, I would like to talk to you guys about a very popular anime character named Naruto Uzumaki. It's gonna sound completely disconnected, but it isn't. Trust me. This might sound crazy, but Emily Cooper and Naruto Uzumaki are very similar characters. But there are a couple very big differences between the two that explain why Naruto works as a character and Emily doesn't. <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this. So for the quick backstory, Naruto Uzumaki was born in a village named Konoha, also known as the Hidden Leaf Village. On the day of his birth, the village was attacked by a giant nine-tailed fox demon that caused an absolute rampage. But the Hokage, the legendary leader and hero of the village, managed to find a way to defeat the nine-tailed fox by trapping him and sealing him inside of Naruto's soul right after his birth. Birth. And in doing this, he saves the village, but also curses a newborn baby. So Naruto grows up an orphan in the Hidden Leaf Village, but as a complete recluse. People hate him, people are afraid of him, they treat him like a pariah, they look at him like he is a monster. See, in the eyes of the village, the monstrous evil god that destroyed their home and killed their family and friends lives inside of Naruto, so Naruto is the monster. To them, he is the nine-tailed fox. He is the one who destroyed the village. They blame him for it. They hate him for it. The other kids of the village bully him, call him names. Parents tell the kids not to talk to him or even look at him. But Naruto is just a regular kid. He just wants to live a regular life, have friends like any other kid, play with them outside, make memories, just overall experience a normal childhood. But he is deprived of that because of what happened on the day he was born, something that he had no control over. Naruto grows up alone, shunned, unloved, feared by all, but from that difficult childhood is born a dream. Naruto wants to become the next Hokage, the next leader and hero of the Hidden Leaf Village. He wants to become the greatest ninja in the world, a legendary warrior. So when he comes of age, he goes to the village's academy to become a ninja, but the thing is, he's not very talented. He's, he's not talented at all, actually. Okay, I'll say it. He kind of sucks. See, when it comes to practical combat or techniques, he always falls behind other students, and when it comes to academics, he's just a complete disaster. People make fun of him, nobody takes him seriously, he's a complete joke to his peers. But what people don't see is that, despite his weaknesses, Naruto has a strength that few people can match. His endless determination. If he falls behind other students when it comes to learning a new technique, he will stay up all night and practice until he gets it right. He's incredibly strict with himself, and he is literally incapable of giving up. That's one of his bigger character traits. No matter how hard things get, he keeps going. What he lacks in talent, he makes up for with hard work. So he'll practice again and again 
again and again, sometimes for so long and so vigorously that he'll just collapse from exhaustion. And he will not stop until he gets it right and can master it better than anyone else in his class. His determination and his devotion to his dream of becoming Hokage quite literally make Naruto an unstoppable force. But the thing is, Naruto doesn't want to become Hokage for the right reasons. At least, not at first. See, the Hokage is a hero, a protector, a person who deeply loves the people of the Hidden Leaf Village and wants to dedicate their lives to protecting that people. And while Naruto probably has that in the back of his mind, we'll get to that in a minute, his reason for wanting to be Hokage is directly linked to the way people treated him. He wants to be Hokage because he wants people to respect him. He wants to be Hokage because he wants people to pay attention to him because no one ever really has. Naruto just wants to be seen. He wants people to look at him and see that he matters, that he is worthy. Eventually, he does become a ninja apprentice, but even after proving himself worthy enough to become one, people still don't really respect him. And he has his flaws. He is kind of an annoying little kid when you meet him. Naruto is loud, obnoxious, disrespectful. He has no manners. He's ridiculously stubborn. He overestimates his abilities all the time, and so people don't really like being around him. His two teammates always look down on him, they think he's a useless drag, and they think having to train with him is a chore. In the beginning, especially, they constantly find themselves having to put themselves in harm's way to save his ass. Again, Naruto is not naturally talented like most of his peers, which causes him to often fall behind. He's not very good in combat, and despite having a big mouth, it takes a really long time before you get to see Naruto actually win a fight. He always gets his ass kicked. Long story short, on the surface, there isn't much to like about Naruto. But as time passes and they get to truly know him, as they learn to see what he truly stands for and what his values are, people cannot help but admire him. Through tough battles and challenges, people begin to see that despite being an annoying kid with bad manners and too much pride, he is also a devoted friend and an infinitely loyal comrade. Naruto has a heart of gold. He is endlessly generous. He values life above anything else. He is willing to put his life on the line for anyone, even people who very outwardly hate him, even people who treated him in the worst ways imaginable. He is incredibly compassionate, supportive. He doesn't want to take success away from his peers. He wants to succeed with them. He loves very deeply. He is a protector at heart, and this village, this village that shunned him and only ever met him with hatred, means everything to him. It is his home, and the people of the village are his people, even if they don't want him. And again, people grow to truly admire how he never gives up, even in fights where he is clearly outmatched. And they can see that every single time he loses a fight, he learns from it, he gets better and smarter in his next fight, and he slowly turns into a formidable adversary that rivals the strongest ninjas in the village. With all of that, a lot of people change their look at Naruto and see that he's actually an inspiring kid, a kid who never had life on his side, who somehow learned to love people despite being rejected by them his entire life, and somehow managed to teach himself great values while growing up lonely in a world where nobody wanted him. And slowly, they get to see that, despite not having the skills to become Hokage yet, he might have the heart to become one in the future. Now, obviously, he doesn't stay that way, as he grows up and goes through some unbelievably grand battles and saves the world numerous times. Naruto matures a lot and we watch him become one of the most powerful and most respected warriors in the world. He learns the true value of his dreams and he eventually wants to become Hokage primarily to protect his home and his people. He makes lifelong friends, some of which were former enemies, and everyone in the village grows to love him and look up to him. Even the most dangerous villains in the show know his name and are well aware that he is not to be underestimated or messed with. With. He becomes a bona fide 
badass, an absolute legend whose name inspires great respect. But I don't want to spoil that part of the story, in case you haven't seen Naruto, you should watch it. Now, let's take a look at the basic elements of Naruto's character in his early days. With Naruto, we have a character that is loud, obnoxious, annoying, desperate for the attention and approval of everyone surrounding him, lacks manners, and never listens to anyone. Does that remind you of somebody? He doesn't really know how to be a good friend, he's disrespectful, he always thinks he's right, he's relentlessly stubborn, he doesn't really think before he acts, he dreams a lot and lives in a world where nobody really likes him or respects him, even in his own field. Does that remind you of somebody? In terms of their global character build, Naruto and Emily are very similar. They technically work the same. So again, why is it that Naruto works so well as a character and Emily doesn't and falls completely flat every single time she comes back? Well, that's for three reasons. Reasons, and these reasons are why I give you such a long breakdown on Naruto's character. Reason number one, Naruto works because we know why he is the way he is. Naruto has such an extensive backstory that sets up his character and explains every single one of his behaviors as a kid. And Emily doesn't have that. See, it's very hard to be understanding of her behavior because there is nothing there to understand. Naruto is this hot-headed, loud, and obnoxious little brat because he grew up being treated like a monster without respect or basic humanity and decency. He grew up lonely and he had to forge himself in that environment to learn to stand up for himself in order to be respected. So even if he's not the most likable, you feel for him because you know and understand where it comes from. You know it's not really his fault. As he starts making friends that feel like a family and starts to overcome his issues, you're proud of him because you get it. He's improving and you can see that in his character. On the other hand though, Emily is an annoying asshole just because. There's nothing about her that can make us empathize enough to see through her bad behavior, and that's due to a writing issue that directly leads me to my next reason. Reason number two, Naruto is an annoying little shithead, but he is made like that intentionally. He's written as this obnoxious kid on purpose, but it's only for him to have a clear path to evolve, to grow into that more mature hero with strong morals and a name that makes the world shiver. His character flaws are there so that he can overcome them as the story unfolds. But Emily? Oh boy! I talked about it many, many times, but it is very clear that Emily wasn't made this unlikable on purpose. It's not intentional at all. All. The writers just created the most insufferable character on TV by complete accident. But like I said, instead of making her better in every new season, they just try to water her down without realizing that just because she's less unlikable doesn't mean she's any more likable. It's almost like they refuse to give her qualities, which is odd because it would be so easy to do that. Emily is such an empty character. She's like a blank canvas. You have all the space in the world to build her up to be a more enjoyable character, but every new season, they decide to just not do that. If the writers were to be a bit more intentional with her character, they could very, very easily fix her. Especially when it comes to my third and final point. Reason number three. This one is kind of obvious, but Naruto has redeeming qualities. Yes, he is annoying, he is disrespectful and obnoxious and all those glaring flaws we just talked about. But Naruto is also genuine, generous, honest, he is strong and hardworking, he cares for people very deeply, he does everything in his power to protect. He has a lot of flaws, but the qualities brought to his character balance things out very effectively. His qualities are just as strong and impactful as his flaws, and that's why it feels so good to see him overcome his flaws as his qualities remain. It's changing the balance of his character, that's what makes him compelling. I have said since season 1 that the indisputable issue with Emily as a character is that she has no redeeming qualities. 
is none. There is nothing about her that balances out her insane amount of flaws. The only likable thing about Emily is the fact that she's played by Lily Collins, who everybody loves, me included. But that is external to her character, it's a meta quality. As she stands, Emily is a character that is entirely made of flaws. And we can't sympathize with those flaws because Emily is so empty that she's not even given a basic backstory. Like I said in my season 3 video, we don't know anything about Emily's life before Paris. We don't know if she had friends, we don't know if her family is around, if she has siblings. Again, she's a blank canvas. There's nothing to her. So what we're left with is her incessant shitty behavior, selfish decisions, backstabbing habits, and a total lack of manners and respect for the people around her. That is all her character is. Now, to be clear, um, I'm not saying the only way to fix Emily is to introduce a nine-tailed fox demon in season four, although I would 100% watch that show. Rather, I'm more interested in exploring the reasons behind Emily's incredibly annoying demeanor. Why is she the way she is? Why is she so starved for attention and respect? Why is she so desperate for people to like her? What happened in her past that defined that trait in her? Why is she incapable of making decisions, even if it means hurting everyone around her to avoid having to do so? What makes Emily so cowardly? What leads her to act so impulsively? And for the record, you can do this without overcompensating complicating the character. It's not like the show is incapable of offering a backstory. Emily's best friend Mindy, while not a great character, has been greatly improved on over the last two seasons by having her glossed over backstory from season one turn into a solid point of motivation for her story. Mindy was a failed pop star in her home country of China who mostly lived well off on her rich father's money, but she decided to live her life differently which led her to being cut off by her parents and she moved to Paris Paris to give herself another chance to succeed with her music. It's simple, sure, but it works. While Mindy is not a great character, having that backstory attached to her makes her a better character than Emily. She feels more tangible, more constructed. Even if I hate having to watch her awful musical numbers in every episode, I get it. That's what her character is about. It's logical. Her extravagance and overall bouginess are entirely a product of her earlier life and to the fact that she grew up extremely rich, so that attitude remains with her even if she's broke now. Those elements are not big, but they make her feel more sensical. Mindy may not be a great character, but she's cohesive. She makes sense. And it's really odd to me that a character that is always relegated to being a basic sidekick ends up being more fleshed out than the protagonist she's being a sidekick for. I'm honestly not sure I understand why Emily is forbidden from having even basic character building. Taking example on Naruto is a perfect way to fix Emily. Give her a backstory that explains her most despicable traits. Do it in a way that can make us sympathize with them. Then balance those despicable traits with some genuine qualities and positive personality traits not only we can see, but the other characters in the show can see in her as well. Let her earn people's respect in an organic way, and most of all, do not try to just water down her flaws. Instead, give her good, solid storylines that allow her to overcome these flaws, to truly learn something for once, to then leave space for her qualities to become her dominating personality traits. That's how you make her a more likable character, and if you give it enough time, you might actually turn her around like Ahsoka Tano was. All of that is achievable by keeping the DNA of the show intact. It's not going to change the tone, you can still make the show as dumb and boring as it has been if that's what you want the show to remain, but at least her character will be more enjoyable to watch. Audiences will be able to like her instead of just tolerating her. But if you want to make the show more fun and actually have a storyline that would get people invested, you could always use that exact same tactic we just talked about, but twist it by making Emily's backstory and life before Paris a mystery. 
Hear me out. What if season 4 reveals that Emily is not only in Paris for her work? What if there was an ulterior motive? What if Emily is not entirely who we believe her to be? What if she's doing everything in her power to stay in Paris and not go back to her life in Chicago for a reason other than her new friends? What if she's running from something? What if something really bad happened back in Chicago that she's been trying to escape? Something that happened to her, or better yet, something she did. What if her friends in Paris start to realize that, like the audience, they don't actually know anything about Emily? Maybe every time her life before Paris is brought up, she finds a way to avoid the topic and people are now starting to pick up on it. The reason why that would make her character interesting is because it's an open door to give her layers. Because suddenly, her one-dimensional, obnoxious, and annoying personality is not so one-dimensional anymore. Suddenly, her excessive quirkiness is no longer her one and only character trait. Suddenly, her character becomes a facade, a calculated mask that hides something darker, something more real, something she is desperately trying to run away from. In the flip of a switch, the extreme lack of substance the writers gave her will no longer make Emily's character empty, but mysterious. Because the show now acknowledges head on that we don't know anything about her, but it also becomes a part of her character. People don't know anything about her because she doesn't want them to. Emily has a secret. Now her character is interesting because there are things to explore with her. There are things to discover about her. You can make people ask a million questions and the anticipation for the answers will make the season actually engaging. It's sort of reminiscent of Serena Vanderwoodson in Gossip Girl. When the show begins, it introduces you to Serena and immediately lets you know that despite being the most popular girl in the city, she left New York very abruptly for an entire year, but nobody knows why. Everything around her departure is very foggy, and it's very clear to some people that she didn't just leave New York, she ran away. But why? She's clearly keeping a secret, and while the whole season is not necessarily about that, because her story is more focused on her romantic relationship with Dan Humphrey, this secret and everything it implicates is a massive element that makes the season compelling, because there is a story there. There is something to follow, something to work towards, something to look forward to. And it's only towards the end of the season that you find out that Serena ran away abruptly because she thought she had killed somebody. Now, Emily in Paris doesn't need to have a twist that dark, but the concept is the same. You give her a secret, you fix her lack of personality as a result, you have an engaging story, and you can build genuine tension. And how do you build tension around it? Well, Serena's mystery is kickstarted by her returning to New York after a year away and having to confront the people who used to be closest to her. So the mystery becomes, why did she leave? Yes, but also, why did she come back? The entire season sees that tension rise. So how do you do that for Emily? She's already been in Paris for almost a year, so the initial kick is long gone. Can't use that. But I think there's still a pretty effective way to give it a good start. If most of the tension is gonna lie around Emily's friends and co-workers realizing they don't actually know her and she seems to not really be honest with them, we need to find a reason for them to truly start questioning her. And that is where you need to introduce a new character. More specifically, a character from Emily's past. What if a new character arrives in Paris from Chicago, maybe to work with Sylvie's agency, and as soon as they arrive, as soon as they enter the room, Emily becomes visibly nervous. She feels off, she's acting weird, anxious, and everyone is picking up on it. But that new character plays coy, doesn't say anything. It's very, very obvious that they know stuff, but they just don't say anything. And everyone can tell that something about it doesn't add up. And that's when they realize that they don't really know anything about Emily's life, and when asked about it, she's very quick to deflect. Based on that, you can create new dynamics for the characters, especially with this new one, and have a fun mystery to uncover in the middle of all the romance and stuff, and lead us to a twist that would make Emily's character more layered and enjoyable for an audience. You could even have a flashback storyline taking place in Chicago before the events of the show, where we would actually 
get to see what Emily's life was like back then. Maybe we'd meet her friends. Maybe we'd get to see, I don't know, a complicated relationship with her parents. Really, the world is your oyster here. It's not reinventing the wheel by any means, but it would provide the show with a largely improved protagonist that is actually at the center of a compelling story. And that is how you fix Emily Cooper. Either that or just kill her off and make season 4 a whodunit murder mystery. Okay, bye!